Welcome, neighbors. I'm Sean, one of the pastors here at North Cross, and I welcome you to North Cross Online. Before we get started, just a few things that I think could be helpful in your experience of online worship with us. First, if you haven't done so already, I'm going to invite you to download the North Cross app. If you do already have it, go ahead and open it now. The North Cross app is filled with features that will enhance your experience of worship. There's an opportunity for you there to submit your prayer requests, to give offering online. You can read scripture along with us. And perhaps most importantly, there's a vital link between you and us here at the church called the Connect Card. Again, if you've already got the North Cross app open, I'm going to invite you now to click on that button Connect and get that filled out. I would also invite you to consider your environment right now. What's around you? What distractions might prevent you from fully entering into worship? Go ahead and eliminate those right now. And if it's helpful, uh, do some things that, that might enhance your experience. Perhaps lighting a candle or dimming the lights. Make yourself comfortable. In just a few minutes, we'll begin with a song. Before we get there, let's start with prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of technology that brings us together. The opportunity for us to gather in worship wherever we are. We pray, God that in these moments we might surrender our hearts to you, that you might fill us with your spirit, that as scripture is opened and proclaimed, as these songs are shared, as our faith is enhanced, we might do it all for you. It is in the name of Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Friends, it is time to worship our Lord, our creator, the giver of life and love. Will you... Stand and join me in a time of praising God, inviting the Holy Spirit to come like you have promised. Pour out your spirit, sing together with us. Stir the stagnant waters of my soul. me with your river which brings life I don't have all the right words to say that will provoke you to want me any more than you
praise you and we thank you that you reign victorious over everything, the darkness, the grief, the pain. You are more powerful and more wonderful than any mountains we might be facing, any trials that might be in our path. You are higher and stronger, greater than we could ever imagine, and we praise you today as we, wherever we are, are gathered to worship you. Your spirit is present in this place. We just take a moment to enjoy your presence and enjoy being with you. Lord, whatever weights might be on our hearts, we offer them to you today for you to replace trouble with peace, with hope, with endurance, trusting that you care, you are for us, and you are with us. I pray you might be speaking through Sean in the scripture that we will learn and grow closer to you, your spirit will be moving through him and in us. Help us not only learn and grow, but truly be transformed by your word today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Friends, I just want to admit right at the beginning here, that there are some pieces of our scripture, some pieces of our faith that are they're just difficult. They're just hard to wrap your mind around. I struggle with understanding how are we supposed to make sense of some of the stories contained even in our Bible. While it's sometimes a matter of language, for me, more often than not, it's the story itself, the, the content of the story, which I find troubling. Take the story that is near the beginning of our Older Testament, back in the book of Genesis. The story I'm referring to is of Abram. Abram is called by God to go and move from where he's at to find a new place that God will show him. And that place will eventually be called the promised land because it is land that's part of a promise that God makes to Abram. Be my follower, and let me be your God, and I will give you this land. I will, as a matter of fact, give you so many descendants that you won't even be able to count them. They'll be as numerous as the stars in the heaven. Reading through that story, and if you continue along in Genesis, it begins in Genesis 12 and and follows all the way to Genesis 21. There's a wrinkle in the middle there. When we're introduced to Abram, we're told he's 75 years old, and that's That's relatively uh, old for what's going to happen next because part of the promise is that Abram will be able to become a father. As we've said, he'll have descendants as numerous as the stars. His wife is just a little bit younger than him, so they're both fairly advanced in age and they haven't been able to have children when we meet them in the story. But it's not long after God and Abram join in this covenant that things begin to really get complicated. Not only is there this promise that's been made, but Abram, who will come to be known as Abraham, tries to fulfill that promise of having children all on his own. Let me just say it doesn't go well. I don't blame him for trying. It's, it's a long period of time between when God makes the promise, I said he's 75, and when God actually fulfills the promise, Abram is at 99 years old. So a long time has gone by, several decades, and, and you could see where you might get impatient. I, I don't blame Abraham for what happens. Again, if you read that whole story between Genesis 12 and Genesis 21, eventually uh, the promise is fulfilled, and both Abraham and Sarah receive a son, Isaac. This is when things, I think, though, really take a turn. I mean, honestly, there's not much about Abraham's story that's not disturbing. I mean, it's hard to say which part is most troubling. But with that said, again, this part where we come to the birth of Isaac and then subsequent years after that birth, 
really make things messy. I don't think that um, I could follow through with it, but we find in Genesis here the story of Abraham being called to sacrifice his son Isaac. I mean, imagine you're Abraham here in Genesis 22. Here's the, here's the verse. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. This is after Isaac has been born. Remember, this is Isaac that they've been waiting for, Isaac that's been promised. Sometime later, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the the knife and the fire. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Friends, I don't know if there's a more troubling story in our scriptures. I just don't know how to make sense of what we've just heard, of what we've just read. We make much of the faith of Abraham, and perhaps we should. Scripture suggests he never doubted God would make everything work out. Miraculously, God does come through. But what disturbs me is God asking Abraham to do it in the first place. What kind of God asks for such a test? Again, I just don't think I could do it. Honestly, I'm just not sure how to reconcile it in my mind. God is surely greater than I am. I believe that God does know everything. God is all-powerful. I believe that God is good. God is just and merciful and loving. But I don't think I learned that from Abraham's story. I don't think I learned that from this passage, at least not directly. No, it's only when God acts later that I feel the story begins to make some sense. Here in our newer testament, the apostle John, possibly the apostle who traveled with Jesus himself, writing after Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection, these words. We have them in a letter we call 1 John. Again, not to be confused with the gospel of John. This is 1 John, one of the letters we have contained a little further in our scriptures. So 1 John chapter 4, this is verse 9. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world 
that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. God shows his love for us by sending his son, his one and only son, Jesus, to live with us. And through him, offer us eternal life. As John said, Jesus is is God's one son, God's one Offspring, God's one and only son. I wonder if in this way we're meant to understand that Jesus is God's Isaac. Abraham is spared from killing Isaac because God provides the sacrifice. Death is avoided, or we might say overcome, because of God's gift, God's intervention. In Jesus... God gives God's self for us. God becomes the sacrifice. John says this this is how we can understand Jesus' death. God dies our death. God takes our place. God does what we cannot do. God doesn't ask for us to sacrifice our children or our marriages or our joy or our health or anything else on an altar to appease God. God provided, and God provides, even now, the sacrifice. Because God is the sacrifice. Charles Wesley, a great hymn writer, one of the brothers who begins to found what we come to know as the Methodist Church, Charles Wesley will write, O love divine, what hast thou done? The immortal God hath died for me. What has God done indeed? God, out of God's love, dies for us because God doesn't want us to die. God wants us to love and to live in communion with him throughout eternity. It turns out when we are talking about love, as we have these past several weeks here at North Cross, we've said we could take each letter of the word love and and let it stand in for another idea, another concept. So L for us in love was linked. We understand that it is love that links us to God. God's agape love poured out for us. It's, It's unmerited, undeserved, unearned, but it also comes with no strings attached. It's the link that exists between us and God. We said, oh, could stand in for others, that we are gifted, blessed, that our our strengths, our talents, our passions, what makes us us is so that we could love others. We are created to need one another. We are created for community. And it is love that it flows from us to others that God empowers with that link, that relationship V, we've said, is for vast, that we can't fully know the extent of God's love. It is so immense, so amazing, so wonderful, so beyond our knowledge that we'll never come to the end of it. It's it's vast. But that we could grow into it. We could take steps deeper into it. We could allow ourselves to be rooted in it. Today, as we conclude this series, as we think about the last letter in the word love, E. E for me is for eternity. The amount of time that God wants to spend with you and with me. The length of life offered us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is eternity. It's forever. It's always. I mean, don't miss that. This is the, this is the point, that, that death would be overcome. And for death to be overcome, there must be a resurrection. There must be life. And in this case, it's, it's new life. You hear it in John's more famous expression, 
of God's love contained in the Gospel of John, verse, chapter 3, rather, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Shall not perish, live forever, have eternal life. Everlasting, never-ending, forever, always life. Well, some live as if that's a future promise. Believe in Jesus and then at some point after death we'll go up to heaven and we'll have this eternity spent harps, clouds, singing songs. Others, however, know that this is a present reality. Eternal life isn't some sweet by and by, it's meant to be lived now. You see, Jesus has come. He's already broken into history. He lived, died, and was raised from the dead. His life has already begun, and he empowers us, gives us, grants us, imparts to us this new life. We don't have to wait for it. We get to enjoy it right now. We get to start right here, right now. In fact, it's the point, according to John. Dear friends, this is verse 11, what we just read earlier. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And we don't love because it's something that's just bubbled up in us. We love because God loved us. And that love changes our life. It it changes who we are. It changes what we do. And allows us to share love. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. In other words, as as, as we're transformed by this love, as we accept this new life, as we live into the eternity that God has promised us through Jesus Christ, others will get a glimpse of God through us. They will see in our loving the love of God. That's not something we wait for. It's something we get to do right now. We love because God first loved us. Our love is made possible by and is a reflection of God's love. So as we love others, God's love is made known. God's love is shared. That's been our whole message here in this series that we could share God's love letter. We could share it with someone today, this week, this life. And we do it by being present, by, by speaking kindly, by offering encouragement, by giving freely, by practicing patience and gentleness and self-control, with humility serving others, investing in our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, that we might turn back hatred with intentional acts of love. I'm going to invite you just to take whatever your next step in that life could look like. Just, you know, consider what it would look like for you to grow in love. What would it look like for you to be more loving, to accept God's love and share that love with another? Let's just admit right now we're going to mess it up. We're not going to get it right all the time. That's not the point. Perfection is not the point. The point is for us to love, and and love is messy. Love is hard, and it's difficult, and we're going to get it wrong. But let's let's not stop loving because of the possibility of getting it wrong. Let's reach out. Let's, Let's make the attempt Let's do as Martin Luther King Jr. invited us to do, to do, to hew a stone of hope out of a mountain of despair. To in the small little actions we take, in the, in the ways we are with people, that we might just slowly over time change our lives and impact those around us. I'm not sure how long it takes to break down a mountain stone by stone but we've got eternity to figure it out. We have eternity to live this love. So let's start.
Will you pray with me? God, there is much in Scripture I don't know how to make sense of. It challenges me to the very core. This story that we have of Abraham binding his son Isaac to be sacrificed is one such story. The the best I can do, God, is to recognize that what you spared Abraham from doing, you did yourself. That in that incredible example, that impossible scenario that I know that I couldn't go through with, you have gone through with. So that all of us might spend all of our lives with you because you desire none of us to die, none of us to perish. You love us so much that you died our death to give us this eternal life. So God, I don't know how to make sense of all that. All I know is this, that those that are listening in this moment perhaps are as confused as I am. And and God, all we can do is stumble forward. So help us in taking that step as as we learn to love. Help us, God. Help us to give more of ourselves. Help us to choose you with each step. Help us to trust that you will provide on the mountains and in the valleys and through all of our days, through all of our struggles. You want to spend eternity with us. We welcome you this day. Help us in the days that come. Again, we pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus, by the power of his Spirit. Amen. God's love for us is never ending and so overwhelming sometimes. It's hard to even know how to respond to this incredible news. One way we get to do that is by offering our gifts back to the Lord through the church. There are different ways that you can do that through the North Cross app or texting to give, using our website, um, mailing something to the church. But I hope and pray that as you do, you would be experiencing this incredible, generous love that God has for you. mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant in the trials and the change, one thing remains, one Never fails, it never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love 
Friends, I'm thankful that God, God's love never gives up on me, never gives up on you, never runs out, never fails. That's the promise. That's what we can trust. That's what, that's what can help us take our next step. And as you take next steps, I pray that, that you know God is with you and for you. I pray that you're strengthened by the power of God's Spirit to love as you have been gifted to love that you might know that you don't have to wait for heaven. Heaven has come to earth in Jesus Christ, and we get to live that eternal life through Christ with God right here, right now. Live with that joy. Live with that promise. Share that good news. Go in peace. Amen. Friends, as you go, I want to remind you, as I've just said, this doesn't have to be the end of our story. It doesn't have to be the end of your journey with us. This coming week, we're going to start Lent, the 40-day period of preparation that leads us into Easter. And for us, Lent begins with Ash Wednesday. There'll be a special sack lunch social at noon central time right here through North Cross. You can check it out on Facebook where you can participate in Ash Wednesday observance, an opportunity to begin your journey of Lent. We'd also invite you to participate with us in the Being Challenge that we'll be engaging through the entirety of Lent. You could get online at playlearnshare.org backslash RLC for Red Letter Challenge, RLC, and you'll find a host of resources there for you to engage in the Being Challenge. Friends, please, whatever you do, do it in love. Go in peace. Amen. than my breath it's over my head so over my head goodness like a river running after me it's over my head so over my head love I